to the Harbor Grace excursion with the boys to have. Books really saved my life. Thank you. Yeah, somehow I never get tired of watching that video. I have seen it dozens and dozens of times, and every time it's just like reliving it all over again. It's fantastic. Well, we'll get into a little bit of the story. But first, I want to say thank you. Thank you for coming. This Winnipeg boy shows up in Toronto. You wonder if anybody will come. I appreciate that you did. And I just have to let you know two things. Number one, it's 30 degrees in Winnipeg today. Yeah, I have told everyone I've met today. And ask, ask the ping folks at Penguin. They will co corroborate that. I have said this nonstop today. Second thing is, 9.30 tonight, I have to be out of here. Anybody know why? Jets. Winnipeg Jets. Clench, clench the series, right? Second series? Yeah. Hold on, folks. Last Canadian team in, in the race for the Stanley Cup. I want to hear all of Toronto cheering for Winnipeg for a change. Hey? Awesome. And a big thank you to the Toronto Public Library. Thank you for having me. And uh, thank you for having me at this event, the June Callwood series. As I looked over that and I began looking at who had been here before me, I quite honestly shuddered. <laughs> and then I was very impressed. And I want to thank you for having me. And as I looked over that list of people who had been here, discussed the thing, look at the discussions of June's life and the things that she worked towards and the things she wanted to do and the things that she did do, I began to ask myself, why? Why am I here? And isn't it interesting that in these moments, we sometimes overlook the most important things in life? Which leads me to a story. In 1964, a little baby was born into circumstances much different than most. The baby was not born into a home with a mom and a dad. Matter of fact, there was no home. The baby was born into a little hospital on the Gulf of Mexico, surrounded by the searing sands of Texas. Immediately upon birth, the baby was placed into an or a home, an orphanage, with the hopes of one day being adopted. There was no home, just a bed. There were no parents, simply workers. The mother was a 20-year-old white girl from the state of Iowa in middle America. The father was a 30-year-old, 30-year-old something, married with children, black man. In 1964, in Iowa, this wasn't going to work. So she was packed up, sent to Texas to have her baby and give it up for adoption. Now, for those of you old enough to remember, you will recall that in the 1960s, America was in turmoil. John Glenn became the first astronaut to circle the globe, the first U.S. astronaut to circle the globe. The Beatles hit number one in the U.S. for the first time, and Muhammad Ali was crowned boxing's heavyweight champion of the world. The Vietnam War raged while Mary Poppins was a hit in theaters. And the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was signed into law by President Lyndon Johnson. Now, if you don't remember what the Civil Rights Act was, it abolished racial segregation in the states. Basically meant at the time segregation that blacks didn't eat in the same restaurants as whites, and whites didn't go to the same schools as blacks. Race riots toured America, and Martin Luther King Jr. received the Nobel Peace Prize that year. It was during this time that I was born a half-breed in a very black and white world. Now, question. What do you do with a biracial, as they called us, baby boy in 1964? Well, I'll tell you what you do. You hang out a free to good home sign and see if you get any takers. But the reality was there wasn't much of a market for this particular product, and the fact was that if you let it get too old, you'll be stuck with it for good. So I was literally put on the speaking circuit from birth. I was taken from church to church, put on display, and offered to any willing takers. Now, I'm told it's not quite as harsh as it sounds. 
It didn't take that long before mom and dad and I found each other. You see, the pastor, the preacher who looked after the orphanage, he was in the Kansas City area one night, and mom and dad happened to be there, and mom now having seen, heard this story and seen this gorgeous baby boy, her word, not mine, <laughs> decided that she needed to hear a little bit more about this story. So the short story is, is that mom and dad fell in love not only with the beautiful baby boy that I was, but also the idea of saving me from certain disaster. Now, when you consider the time, the age, the odds as they were stacked against me, I am amazed that I've had the opportunity to pen these words. But you see, my parents took on social justice in their time for not only me, but for me and five more. They went on to uh, not only to adopt me, but after me, four more boys, another girl. And that was in addition to the three children they already had of their own. We are up to nine. I always told mom, mom, you had more heart than brains, <laughs> which always got me smacked. I remain, I remain amazed at what they were willing to do. I remain amazed at the strength and the, the character that it took to, in 1964, do what very few other people would have ever done. Because trust me, folks, there was not a line out the door of the orphanage looking for biracial babies at the, in that time. So if I have gained any right to stand here this evening, it is because first and foremost, because of my parents. They were a living, breathing example of what it meant to me for social justice, that they took in five, six kids that nobody else wanted. They saw this orphan in his time of need and did what few others would dare to do. Then it was September of 2013 Two and a half years after I had been diagnosed with par young onset Parkinson's disease at the age of 46. Parkinson's most generally is not a bother to people under the age of 60. Statistically, the vast majority of people diagnosed with Parkinson's are 60 plus. About 15% are diagnosed below the age of 50 and about 10% are diagnosed before the age of 50. I was 46. I can now list for you, you've now heard two major lotteries that I have won in my life. <laughs> Adoption, Parkinson's. Two and a half years after I was diagnosed at the age of 46, my son and I had just won the Amazing Race Canada. That first year of being diagnosed with Parkinson's was a blur. I knew no, no one my age with Parkinson's disease. I was struggling, to say the least, to make sense of what was going on in my life. At the year, end of year one, my dear wife had talked to my son and I into applying for the Amazing Race. At the end of year one of being diagnosed, we got accepted to the race. That next year was spent in chaos as we prepared for the race, ran the race, and then kept the secret about the race until it was done. That September, my now good friend, Marina Joseph from, the Parkinson's, from Parkinson's Canada, calls me and says, Tim, would you like to come to Montreal and speak for the World Parkinson's Congress? Sure, what's that? I had no clue what the World Parkinson's Congress was. Turns out that it's an event that happens every th three years somewhere around the globe and in Montreal, there were 3,000 people who showed up with, par not, with Parkinson's or interested in Parkinson's. They either had Parkinson's, they were a care partner of someone with Parkinson's, researcher, doctor, healthcare provider. And P Parkinson's Canada wanted me to come and be the surprise guest speaker for this group of people. I said, that sounds cool. So said, sure, I'll come. And then she said, well, just let me know what your fee will be. I'm like, you'll pay me? Like, I'm in. <laughs> and then she tells me how long I have to speak. 
five minutes. Five minutes. Montreal. Paid. Can we do a little more of this? <laughs> but let me tell you something, folks. That five minutes changed my world. I had no idea of all the things that were out there for Parkinson's, for people living with Parkinson's disease. And suddenly I'm introduced to literally a world of Parkinson's. Five minutes later, and, and I should tell you that I was terrified that for, that, for that speech. I, I still, when I watch that speech again, I go back and I see it, and there's my beloved wife standing next to me. And to this day, I think, why did I have her come on stage with me? And then I remember, because you were scared out of your mind. <laughs> but that five minutes has literally taken me around the globe in speaking on behalf of Parkinson's, speaking corporately, and to a whole raft of opportunities that I would have never had, had it not been for Parkinson's. But as I stood on that, as I prepared for that speech that, at that time, I felt completely lost. I had this feeling of, what do I say to all of these people when I'm still trying to figure me out, when I still haven't got a handle on what it is for what Tim Haig is going to do with this thing called Parkinson's? But as I continued to tell my story, continued to share this thing called The Amazing Race, I began to find this profound resonance with this group of people. You've all heard of Michael J. Fox, and we so appreciate the voice that he has brought to Parkinson's. But I realized we have few voices, few voices in our community who can share what this disease is. So often we find that the community, the broader community doesn't understand what we're going through. At, we often understand that Parkinson's is a tremor. We see Michael's shakes or his little wonky walk, but no one ever talks to us, talks about the anxiety, the depression, the mild cognitive impairment, which drove me out of my nursing career. And that mild cognitive impairment doesn't mean what you think it does. It doesn't mean Alzheimer's. It doesn't mean a vast dementia. It simply means that you can't plan, organize. You can't do all that multitasking that you once could. It's very easy for me to get overwhelmed with lots of information. If things are coming at me just nonstop, it's very easy just for my brain to just shut down. And I call it freezing now for the, for the mind, because we often see people advanced in their Parkinson's have a hard time walking. And that's what it feels like my brain does. It just gets really slow and sluggish and stops. And I know what I need to do. I know what I need to think about, but it just won't work. And there are so many things that come with Parkinson's that we don't understand and that people often look at me and they say, you look great, Tim. And while I appreciate that, I hate that statement because I so often don't feel great. We so often don't feel what we look like. And Parkinson's is this insidious, nasty little disease. To give you a definition of it, Parkinson's is a progressive, a chronic progressive neurodegenerative disease that results in the decreased production of dopamine in the substantia nigra portion of the brain. Got it? Okay, I always keep that sentence in my, in my speech because it makes me sound really smart. <laughs> but here's what it really means. Parkinson's is a chronic, progressive, it will get worse with time, nerve disease of the brain that results in the decreased production of a chemical called dopamine. Dopamine is not only our happy drug, it is that runner's high drug, but it's also responsible for movement. It's produced in the substantia nigra portion of the brain. So if you were to look right down through the middle of my brain, you wouldn't find much, <laughs> but you would find the thalamus. And right underneath the thalamus is a little place called the substantia nigra. And the substantia nigra is tasked with the production of that chemical called dopamine. Now, I used to be able to give you a really good illustration of, Park, of Parkinson's, but I can't anymore. So it always go like this. 
and my hand would shake. But my doc discovered this little drug called selegiline. And between levodopa and selegiline, I don't shake so much anymore. Yes, thank you. <laughs> that is a good thing. I actually think better. I can think more clearly. Life feels a whole lot better because of those things. But Parkinson's is often that tremor that you see. And that tremor leads to a crazy juxtaposition of moving too much to not being able to move at all. So when you see Michael J. Fox on television, and you see those funky movements that he's prone to making, that's not Parkinson's. That's his meds. Because he's gone from moving too much to being stiff, taking medication, which overshoots our body a bit, and we end up with what's called a dyskinesia. And then there's slowness and loss of balance. We call those the four motor symptoms of Parkinson's. Tremor, rigidity, slowness, and loss of balance. And then along with it, all the other things that we discussed. So, as I continued to tell my story, continued to find that people were taking encouragement from it, it grew. I started speaking in schools, started speaking for corporate events, and we're able to share that message of what Parkinson's is and what it looks like for people and how communities can get involved and help people. As my speaking career now started to progress, I started talking to other professional speakers and I thought, you know what, this is a good gig. I like talking, I like people, they seem to wanna to pay me to come do this, we should perpetuate this. <laughs> And so as I spoke to other professional speakers, they said, if you're going to stay in this gig long term, you've got to do two things. You need a website, and you need a book. So I said, okay, well, I can pay for somebody to do a website, and I can throw words on a page, right? Must be easy. Yeah, how many writers in the room? Yeah, yeah not easy. I went out it, though, started writing, ended up realizing that I could throw words on a page, and it was not turning into a book ended up hiring a writing coach, and off I go. Uh, and as I began to write, I began to discover. I began to discover things about myself. I began to realize that this process was therapeutic. You see, I have to admit to you, I never dreamt of being a writer. I did not grow up dreaming of one day having a book on a shelf. I, I just didn't. And all of this has come to me. And as I began to walk through this process, it, it became real, it became alive. And I started seeing things in my life that I had not looked at before, or looked at very differently. And so it began to grow up and all this stuff started to come to be, together and I began to see the many lessons that I had taken from running The Amazing Race started to parallel with so many lessons that I had learned in life. I started to say, you know what, maybe there's an interesting story here. In 1964, few people expected much of my life. In 1964, if you'd have pulled anybody aside and said, what do you think that biracial kid's gonna grow up to be? You'd have probably got drunk, addict, criminal. Few expected much out of me in 1964. Few expected much out of us on the race. How many of you watched the, our season of The Amazing Race? Oh, that's good, that's good. How many of you thought we'd win? <laughs> There's generally one. No? All right, thank you, there you are. There's always one in the crowd and I always get to say, were you drinking? <laughs> Because we never, ever gave you any hope that we would ever be successful. We struggled, leg after leg. I, I mean, really. If it wasn't my Parkinson's that was giving me trouble, it was the simple fact that we couldn't read a map. We were lost all the time. No one ever expected us to ever succeed. No one ever expected me to su succeed in life. We sucked on the race. And most people figured my life would turn out pretty sucky. But we chose to persevere. 
In leg three of the race, we hit our first non-elimination leg. A non-elimination leg means you come in last, and when you should typically be thrown off the race, they spare you. We hit both in our season and still went on to win. You can count on one hand how many times that has happened in the Amazing Race franchise. It doesn't happen. But in leg three, we were in Drumheller, Alberta, and we were having a rough time with the race. It was the first time we come in last. We were not doing well. We knew we weren't doing well, and we were very close to going home because not only had we come in last, been spared, but the next day we were going to have an extra task to do. So while everybody else would go through their normal day, we would have that extra task to do and likely get kicked off then. We sat down and we had a discussion with ourselves, my son and I, as to what in the world we were going to do. And I'm going to have to leave that story to the book, but at the end of the discussion, we simply decided we were going to do our best. We were going to get up every morning, have fun, and simply do our best. And folks, what I've come to realize is that is the heart and soul of perseverance. Perseverance, when you don't know where else to go, when you don't know what else to do, when everything else has fallen apart and nobody thinks you're going to survive, you learn to persevere. I think that these lessons have come to me fairly naturally as life has gone on, simply because of my parents. When you consider the life of a 20-year-old white girl who finds herself pregnant by an older married black man in Iowa, she's off the farm, she's never had a whole lot of freedom, and suddenly she finds herself in Texas, all alone. No one in the family knows why she's gone. No one in the family knows where she's, went, where she's been sent. She has her baby, finds out that the orphanage isn't going to try to adopt him, but is in fact going to try to raise him in the home, comes back and throws a living fit that if they don't take care of her boy, she's going to take him home. When you look at that life, that's perseverance. That's more than just don't quit. There's something else there. When you look at parents whose church told them, you're wrong to adopt this black baby. They informed him that he was brown and took him home anyway. <laughs> when everyone, just about everyone in their world told them that what they were doing was wrong, and yet they not only took that boy home, but then went and took five more home, that's perseverance. The definition I like to use for perseverance is this, to carry on in your course of action, even in the face of difficulty, with little or no evidence of success. Eleanor, my birth mom, chose to carry on in her course of action, even in the face of difficulty, even when there was no evidence that I would ever be successful. My parents chose to carry on in their course of action, even in the face of difficulty, without ever knowing whether any of these kids would grow up to be healthy, good, kind, or love them back. They chose to persevere. I am pretty convinced that perseverance was bred in the bone, and it was preparing me for the day that I was diagnosed with Parkinson's. How can I do this? How can I not? I have lived the definition of Parkinson's, of perseverance, 
I'm living the definition of Parkinson's. I have learned that I can stay in my race, that I can stay in my lane and I can stay on my journey, even in the face of difficulty, even when everybody expects you to be thrown out of the race on the next leg. I have learned that I can stay in the race and win. It has convinced me that I can stay in the race in life and win. I've come to see that perseverance is more than just don't quit. It is when you have reached that place where you have fought, where you have struggled, where you have scratched and clawed, when you have screamed and yelled, when you have become angry and, yes, even cried, and you have no idea where and you don't know what else to do, it is there and then that we can learn to persevere. Perseverance is a set of practical, positive steps that we can take, that we can learn, that will take us further, help us not only to survive, but to thrive and do far more than we ever imagined. I know this because I've seen it. I've lived it. I'm convinced that in it, we can learn the strength to simply do our best. We can learn to have the courage to be content. We can learn the will to persevere. And thus, I work with a charity back home that we started, U-Turn Parkinson's. Why U-Turn Parkinson's? Because in the race, there's a U-Turn. And the point of the U-turn in the race is to slow down or eliminate another team from the, from the race. And our goal at U-turn Parkinson's is to slow the disease and one day see it eliminated from life. We can work through U-turn Parkinson's. We can work through the book Perseverance. It is my hope and my deep desire to see people encouraged their lives lifted up, given that, that strength to take the next step, even when life is difficult, even when it's hard. It's our chance to help others live their best through the practice of wellness by offering Parkinson's, rock steady boxing classes, yoga Parkinson's, tremble clefts, a choir, educational th pieces, and on and on. There is much that we can do because we've learned that we can persevere. We can carry on in our course of action, even when it's difficult, even when there's no evidence of success. We can stay in our race, and we can win. That is my encouragement for you tonight. And I wish you the very best as you stay in your journey and you practice perseverance. I'll be excited to hear your stories and to hear where it's taken you. God bless you, and thank you very much for letting me share some of my story with you.